morning. Happy Mother's Day. What a joy it is to be together. Let us at this time prepare our hearts to worship God. Thank you. 
rejoicing and thanksgiving. We thank you that indeed, just as your eye is on the sparrow, just as you bring beauty to the fields and the lilies of the field, so you watch over us, your people. We who have been created in your image, a special creation of all your creation, you care for us, you love us with an amazing and a wonderful love. And out of that love you have given to us salvation, out of that love you have given to us new life. Out of that love, we have the hope that one day Christ will come again and will bring us home. But God, on this special day, we also thank you that out of your love, you have given to us our mothers. And we thank you for them. We cherish them. We honor them. We remember them. And we thank you that they were part of our lives and are part of our lives. And we pray for mothers everywhere today as they seek to raise children, as they seek to love children. And may you give them a special blessing today. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that helps all of us to live a life of love following your example. But God, we know that there are times, whether it's mothers or fathers or children, that we do not always do those things that you want us to do. And so in this moment, we examine our lives and confess our sins to you. We thank you for the assurance we find in Scripture that reminds us that whenever we confess our sins, you forgive us of our sins. And you cleanse us and purify us, and through your Holy Spirit, you help us to seek not to sin again. So God, this morning we give you praise and glory, thanking you for your love for us. We thank you for all you do in our lives. And we ask that you would hear our praise and worship that it may be pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us indeed praise God together, standing with your able as we sing.
joy that we have to celebrate and a, a privilege and an honor to think about motherhood and to think in particular about our moms. And this morning we're going to uh, be looking at two characteristics, if you will, two qualities of mothers, and that, of course, is love and loyalty. And as I looked at that sermon title, I thought that in my own family, this actually could be, in fact, the title of two women in my own family, literally. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother's name was Mabel Ruth. Uh, she didn't like the name Mabel. So all of her life, she went by the name of Ruth. But Mabel Ruth was a very godly woman, and indeed, uh, was a woman who her story was of love and loyalty to family, starting with my grandfather, and to family, and of course also to God himself. But she didn't keep that to herself. She passed that on to her one of her daughters, actually both of her daughters, but one of her daughters that I care about because I'm my mom, whose name was Janet Ruth. She went by Janet, but she didn't mind Janet. But she carried on that idea that her mother passed on to her, a love and loyalty to family and to God. And I hope you had, even by a different name, that your mom also was a Ruth, a Ruth with godly loyalty, godly love, one who truly taught you how to live in that type of devotion and commitment. Well, this morning we're not going to talk about my family, but we're going to go back into the Old Testament. We're going to talk about Ruth. Ruth, who has a small book named after her, and a story that tells a little bit about her, a story that talks about her love and her loyalty. The story of Ruth takes place in the period of time in Israel's history where there were judges. That was a 330-year period between the time of Joshua, who brought the people into the Promised Land, and Samuel, who in fact was the last judge. Now, during that time, the period of time could be summarized as the Book of Judges summarizes it itself by saying, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Or more literally, it says, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Oh, how things have not changed. Have they? <laughs> but what's interesting is that even though in the book time of Judges and even today, everyone seems to do what is right in their own eyes, that was in stark contrast, of course, to Ruth herself, as we will soon learn. Well, during the time of Judges, when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes, there was a pattern, there was a cycle of how things went. And let me just quickly give you that cycle. So it was that in the time of the Judges, the people of Israel, first of all, they would adopt the lifestyle and idolatry of those people who lived around them. And you can see some of those, the Ammonites, the Midianites, the Moabites, the Philistines and Canaanites, they would adopt the sinful lifestyle and idolatry of those individuals. Secondly, this then would lead to um, God becoming angry with them and in fact delivering them into the hands of oppressing nations around about them, which seems ironic, doesn't it? Here they would adopt the lifestyle and idol worship of these countries around them, and God then would send these countries to oppress them because they were not following Him and what He called them to do. Well, then thirdly, in our cycle, the people, of course, would cry out to God, and He would deliver them from these oppressors. He would raise up and anoint judges who would come and deliver them from the oppression of these countries. And so it was that the people of Israel, then they would recommit themselves to God. But only for a short time, because then the fourth, as we kind of circle back around, once that judge died, the people once again would adopt the lifestyle and idol worship of those countries around them. 
And so the cycle would begin all over again. Well, it was into this time and in this time period that a man by the name of Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons, Malin and Kilian, lived in Bethlehem. And while they were living in Bethlehem, a famine came. A famine arose. Now, some scholars believe that it's possible that the famine being talked about in the book of Ruth was the same famine that was being talked about in the book of Judges during the time of Gideon. Now, there may have been other famines during the time of the Judges, but during the time of Gideon is the only one actually the book of Judges mentions. So some people think, well, maybe that was the one. The, the famine that happened during the time of Gideon was caused by the Midianites and the Amalekites and the Ammonites coming and invading the people of Israel. And this is the description that the book of Judges gives us. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. And so the famine was not because there was not rain, but rather the famine was because the surrounding countries came, took what they wanted, and destroyed the rest so that Israel had nothing to eat. Well, because of this famine, because of this situation, Elimelech decided that what was best for his family was to leave that area and go to the land of Moab. Now, the Moabites were descendants, actually, of the people of Israel. Uh, they were descendants, actually, of Lot's oldest daughter. And so Elimelech takes the family and they go to Moab to kind of, hopefully, to wait out this famine period of time. While they're there, Malin and Killian, they, in fact, uh, marry Moabite women. But over time, Elimelech, Malin, and Kilian all die there in Moab, leaving three widows to fend for themselves. Well, it wasn't long after that that Naomi learns that the famine back in Israel was over. And so she felt that Instead of staying in a foreign land, she should go back to Bethlehem, where maybe some family, some friends, would help her survive what it meant to be a widow in those days. And although she was willing to go back to Bethlehem, she encouraged Ruth and Orpah, encouraged them who were Moabites to stay in Moab and, and seek help from the, their families. Maybe at their young age they could get married again. And they could have a productive life. What we learn, though, as she encourages them to stay while she goes back, is that Ruth responds, sharing with Naomi her deep, unconditional, selfless love and loyalty to Naomi. And so in your Bibles, if you have a Bible handy, Ruth chapter 1. Verses 16 to 17, we have Ruth's response to Naomi in her encouragement to stay in Moab. Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. This is a familiar passage to many, and in fact, this passage is often used in wedding ceremonies. And you can see why. Because in these words of Ruth, there is a strong and total and utter commitment that she is giving to Naomi, but also to God. In terms of her commitment, 
to Naomi, she recognizes that both she and Naomi are in the same situation. They are both widows. And back in those days, that was a virtually impossible situation without the help of family and friends. Without the help of family and friends, they were destined to poverty. They were destined to misery, social issues and problems. And so it is, recognizing that both Ruth and Naomi are in the same situation, Ruth says to her, I'm not going anywhere. And don't encourage me to go anywhere. I am going to go with you. And Ruth is saying, because we are family. We are family together. We are in the same situation. And she says, I will be with you. And in fact, she says, that may God, the Lord, Yahweh, deal with her ever so fairly if it is not just death that separates them. Just like in the wedding ceremony, till death do we part. Ruth was not thinking about herself. She was not thinking about her own situation and the difficulty she herself would have, but she was saying, we're in this together. We're family. We're one unit. What happens to one happens to the other. The good and the bad. We will do this together. And that was Ruth's loyal commitment out of love for Naomi. That we will do this together. But her commitment was not just to Naomi. But her love and loyal commitment was also to God. She says to Naomi, your God will be my God. And this doesn't come out of just a blind faith, but no doubt through her relationship with Naomi and her relationship with her husband Malan, she had a relationship with the one true God of Israel. She even calls him rightly by name. She calls him Elohim. She calls him God. She also calls him Yahweh. I am. And she says that just Naomi, as he is your God, he is also my God. And together, we will live together in the land where you are from. We will survive together. We will work together. Because your God, who is my God, will watch over us. In a similar way with Ruth, we too have a variety of relationships. And one of those important relationships, of course, is family. And what's imp most important in that family relationship, of course, is marriage. But beyond that relationship, there's also the parent-child relationship, as well as extended family relationships. And each one of these relationships require a commitment of love and loyalty. And as we think about these relationships that we have, especially in our families, it is easy when things are going well to love and to be loyal. But it's when those stressors come, when those differences of opinion come, when those frustration comes, when those disappointments come, when, when even some hurtful words and actions come. In those times, it's not so easy to love and to be loyal. Because you know, along with me, that when those times come, we don't feel loving somebody. We don't even feel like liking them. And at least for a time, what we do is we decide to separate. You know, silent treatment. We go our way, they go their way. And the problem is that happens for too long a period of time. The separation We do that with family. We do that with friends. We do that with God. When God doesn't do what we want Him to do, when 
God doesn't fit our expectations as faulty as they may be. I will 
will be with you, and I will support you. And so it is that we too, in our commitment to family, in our commitment to friends, in our commitment to God, we too must not just say the words, but we must put those words into actions. We can't be people just say, I love you, I'll be there for you, anything you want, I'll give you, and then walk away and do nothing. That's what James said. James chapter 3, verse 14 and following. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? We need to tell people we love them and then put actions to it. We need to tell people we care for them and then put our actions to it. We need to tell people, I'm there for you, anything you want. And then when they come and asking, we need them to love them and to give to them that which they need. We need to put action to our words. And not just with people, not just with family, not just with friends, but also with God. How often do we come to a worship like this and proclaim, Jesus, I love you. And we walk away not doing what he calls us to do. And what does Jesus call us to do? John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. John 15, 10, If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. If we say, Jesus, I love you, we need to do what he has commanded us to do, which is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Ruth was rewarded for her loyalty and her love. God continued to watch over her. God continued to care for her. God provided for her a husband. What Ruth, the, the story of Ruth tells us, was a kinsman redeemer. This goes back to the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law stated that if a woman's husband were to die, the closest relative was supposed to marry her and provide for her, called a kinsman redeemer. And so it is that Boaz became that kinsman redeemer, married Ruth and cared for both Ruth and for Naomi, and even gave to her at least one son. That one son's name was Obed. He grew to be a man, and he also had at least one son whose name was Jesse. And Jesse grew to be a man, and he had seven sons, the youngest of whom was David. And of course, King David became the greatest king of Israel, and through King David was the promise of the Messiah. And Matthew chapter 1 makes it very clear that from Ruth and Boaz came Obed, Jesse, David, and down the line, Jesus, the Messiah. And there in Matthew 1, one of four women in the genealogy was Ruth. A foreigner, but who demonstrated her love and loyalty to her mother-in-law Naomi, and ultimately to God, Yahweh. Ruth is a great model and a great example for all of us, mother, father, child, whoever you are, of love and loyalty to family, to friends, but above all to God. Let us follow her example as we seek to live the type of life God called us to do, live. And let us do so as an expression of our gratitude to Him for providing for us our kinsman redeemer, Jesus the Christ. Let us pray.
Holy gracious God, we thank you and praise you for the joy of being reminded once again about the story of Ruth. A story of love and loyalty. A love and a loyalty that she had towards her mother-in-law, Naomi. A story of love and loyalty that she had towards friends. And a story of love and loyalty that she had to you. God, may we follow her example. We dedicate ourselves today to that same type of love and loyalty to our families, in our marriages, to our children, to our extended families, to our friendships, but most importantly to 